Uh, unfortunately, we only have one hour. It was supposed to be one hour and, and a quarter, so we will be in a hurry. Uh, my name is Ana Maria Kosmoglu. I work with the Stavros Nyarhus Foundation. Uh, I would like to, to present So I can say correctly the titles of our distinguished guests. So in my side, Mr. Vangelis Kiriakidis, uh, Director of the Organization Initiative for Heritage Conservancy. Um, next, Mr. James Wright, Director of the American School of Classical Studies. Next is Mr. Jacob Fish, Executive Director of the Friends of the Israel Antiquities Authority. Next to him is Ms. Mihailovic, Secretary General of uh, Europa Nostra. And last but not least, Ms. Nicoleta Valaku, Director of Prehistoric and Classical Antiquities in the Ministry of Culture. A few words before we start. I'll be brief, so to give space for our participants to, to share with us their knowledge. Um, uh, a few words on why we chose this subject and how it relates to youth unemployment, the wider uh, topic of today's uh, the whole day discussion. Um, we've heard it also in the morning uh, during the Endeavor presentation that cultural tourism, culture and tourism, but both together also, are one of the sectors considered to be a driver for growth for this uh, country in particular. So uh, when the foundation decided to, with an initiative, to, to try to find ways to create opportunities for the youth in Greece, that was a topic that was selected as a potential field of intervention. Uh, so we have already started discussion, uh, discussions to create a pilot project, uh, trying to see how we could uh, trial and then perhaps create a best practice in order to combine uh, the preservation, the upgrade, the promotion of cultural heritage in combination with tourism and through this way creating opportunities for job creation and in general social and economic development. Um, so, without further ado, uh, first speaker to start is Ms. Balak. Uh, ah, sorry, apologies. Uh, can we try to make it a bit shorter? Sorry, I, we had yeah. initially... <laughs> yeah, sorry, thanks. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Kosmoglu, thank you very much. I thank also the institution, uh, the Stavros Naxos Foundation, uh, uh, to be here with you and to, uh, to speak about this project that you are now um, planning. Uh, I will speak in Greek because I'm in my country and uh, I think that uh, you will be uh, there will be the translation, okay? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can somebody yeah, then sure. bring us the... the the headphones. We don't yet speak Greek. Ah. <laughs> okay. No, we no, 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 there are headphones. Is somebody going to bring us? Okay, good. So, as you know, culture today is re being recognized as one of the four pillars of sustainable development greatly contributing to improving the quality of life, but also to fostering development. So according to statistical data, culture in 2010 accounted for 4.5% of the European GDP. So today in the European Union, the sector of culture is considered of great importance. It boosts the economy, but at the same time, it is also considered a public and social good. So the EU structural funds place great emphasis on making full use of these resources which make up the so-called cultural capital so that member states can create high added value but also external economies directly linked to cultural heritage. Is it okay? Can you hear the translation? Okay. So in the last 20 years, thanks to the co-finance projects of the EU, the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Sports has included 1,319 projects with a budget of 2.3 billion euro in the sector of cultural heritage. Let me tell you, in Greece today, we have 206 state-run 
or state-supervised museums, as well as 169 organized archaeological sites. So a lot has been done, and this has had a major impact on the Greek economy. So according to results of a relevant survey undertaken by a group of experts, and this was announced uh, at a conference uh, organized by the Ministry of uh, Culture and Sports entitled Heritage First Towards a Common Approach for a Sustainable Europe last March uh, under the Hellenic uh, Presidency of the Council of the European Union. It has been estimated that an investment of 1 million euro in a cultural heritage project has a multiplier effect on the economy as a whole. This can amount to 2.360 million euro, which uh, is uh, broken down into 840,000 uh, for wages, and it uh, is equivalent to 46 man years. So the cultural heritage in Greece is directly linked to the development of tourism, but to the development of the economy at large. So we're talking about uh, the cultural heritage, which offers you a unique experience. It's a Aesthetics are wonderful, so this is what could actually diversify the tourist product of Greece. So diversification, enrichment, but also uh, renewal of the tourism product will uh, be directly linked to cultural heritage. But so we know that archaeological sites and museums restore the balance between the present and the past. It also takes into account collective memory, the identity of the local inhabitants, uh, but also modern life. So this can contribute to the future of a community or a city. In this way, cultural heritage can become the means for innovation, socioeconomic innovation. It could also make us uh, use uh, resources in a more effective way. It can boost employment and uh, promote uh, social cohesion. People have a sense of ownership, and people love cultural heritage, and they want to maintain it, to conserve it, and enjoy it. So we're talking about uh, experiencing the archaeological sites and monuments. This allows you to become familiar with the sites and monuments so this means that they are included in public life in this way. Can you change slides? So it is within this context that uh, the preparation and planning for the next uh, programming period, I'm talking about the multi-financial framework, multi-annual financial framework, 2014-2020. So in this planning, we have included initiatives to make full use of the monuments and museums of the country. We're going to create various cultural routes and various actions, which will be addressed to a different uh, public every time. So we also have different actions in order for us to promote cultural tourism tourism, cultural entrepreneurship, and also the other services that can be rendered. So it's not just to enrich the tourism product and not just to have a diversified product. We're also trying to help downgraded uh, areas in the uh, city fabric, for example, in Athens, in order to use the cultural good in order to deal with the different disparities one sees due to the current economic crisis. So we're trying to come up with the best solutions. We're trying to find the practices in order to achieve the aforementioned objectives. This is why we decided to design a pilot project. This pilot project will make use of international experience, but also Greek experience on the basis of the management of cultural heritage. And it will also highlight best practices and uh, how to collaborate with civil society but also the private sector. So uh, to this end, we will try to find new me tools, new means that must be included in a new model for the management of archaeological sites and museums in order for them to be upgraded, but also in order to offer a wider uh, range of pr services. So the legal framework for this program are defined by Article 24 of the Greek Constitution and Law 3028 of 2002 on the protection of antiquities and cultural heritage. So it's not just the promotion and uh, protection. We also need to have sustainable management of cultural heritage. We will also make um, use of everything that is um, mentioned in international conventions that have been ratified by Greece. So the Ministry of Culture and Sport is ex 
Oficio, uh, the responsible body for the management of uh, cultural heritage. But at the same time, we promote collaboration with non-government organizations like Diazoma. And I'd like to say that we've been working very close with Diazoma, but we're also working very closely with the private sector. This pilot project, uh, following uh, the proposal by the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation, is now being implemented. Uh, this program is implemented in collaboration with the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation and the non for profit charity Initiative for Heritage Conservancy. So it is within this program that we will identify but also implement good practices in order to promote archaeological sites and museums and effectively incorporate them in local communities, but also in the global community. So initially, this program will be implemented in two sites. The results of this implementation in these two areas will then be used as a guide, and then five more museums and sites will be added, and I hope that then it will uh, be rolled out uh, all over Greece. Thank you very much for your attention. And to add the second part of the presentation, Mr. Evangelos Kyriakidis. Thank you. So very briefly, because um, we don't have that much time, um, I'm going to very briefly re uh, return to um, uh, who we are, why we're in this partnership. Uh, I'm going to speak in English, because I realize quite a lot of you don't speak English, don't speak Greek. Um, and so um, the Initiative for Heritage Conservancy um, is a non-for-profit charity. And it's there for mainly two reasons. Um, the one reason is that heritage is increasing as time passes. Uh, we're discovering new things, and we are creating new things. And uh, budgets are shrinking. So um, this is a problem all over the world. But there is a, a greater problem, issue, if you like, uh, that heritage should be a source of culture um, and education um, and local pride and sustainable development. Um, and we should be able to take advantage of this great resource that is non-renewable. So these two issues we are here to tackle uh, with shrinking budgets. And so therefore, the main thing that we can do about this is to change the way we manage heritage. Um, the, the institutions that manage heritage in every country are different. In, in this country, the only institution that manages heritage really is the Ministry of Culture. So we're here to support the people who, um, uh, who are here to manage culture, cultural heritage. So the Initiative for Heritage Conservancy is here to promote good practice in heritage management through education and research. And so our structure has got a leading academic committee and auditors, um, good partners internationally, and we are under the auspices of the ministry. Um, we are concentrating on certain areas because we can't do everything. Um, and one of them is IHC Digital, where we are conducting research, but also creating the human resources that can actually use this great tool for management for whatever you want to do with heritage management, creating applications, and creating uses for the digital content um, for the managers to be able to use more effectively what they have to manage. These are our partners in the IHC Digital. Uh, IHC Conservation has mainly dealt with uh, a Nyarkos funded project on how climate change affects the management of monuments. And we've created an international think tank for this area, created exhibitions uh, for lobbying, and created workshops again, training the experts on how to adapt climatic condition, climatic projections for their area in combination with the um, material of building for the heritage sites that they are working on. IHC Public is working with public engagement and the activation of local communities in the uh, to be more positive forces in, in um, uh, the management of monuments. Um, and uh, here this is uh, um, our project in Crete, uh, where we are uh, again creating human resources on how to use ethnography um, to adapt your strategies for research, but also to embrace the local community and be embraced by them. 
all these people are hosted by locals in a 19th century village in, in Upland, Crete. And people like this one or that one. IHC Legal is working again, trying to help the people who are uh, at managing positions um, wherever they are, um, trying to interpret international treaties so that they can become understandable by the people who have to apply them because international treaties have been negotiated by lawyers and archaeologists are not lawyers to understand what these are on about. A more important program is a leading program on, um, on, on man uh, heritage management uh, that is a combination of business management skills with uh, heritage and archaeology skills and this is a unique program um, that's basically teaching anything from project management to education programs and archaeology, public archaeology and all that um, to uh, heritage managers around the world. So what better way than to promote good practice uh, in a country than to do a pilot program and try and see how international practice, how international good practice will apply to the national context of a specific country, and this case is the case of Greece. Every site, as you know, is very different, so you can't manage everything in the same blanket way, but also every country is different. They've got different traditions and different tra trajectories um, that, that research has taken throughout the years. And so, um, as, as Nicoletta Valacu mentioned earlier, uh, this is the scholarship program for the master's program. Um, so this is um, uh, some of the ideas that we look uh, internationally when we are managing heritage. And you know, um, we first identify what the sites stand for. Uh, we try to see um, what do the sites mean for different stakeholders and, and what is the weight of the different values that each site stands for for different people. And sometimes these values can be conflicting. Some people may see uh, a heritage site as a place where they will expand their business into. Some others might see a place that needs to be protected, and these might be conflicting. Um, also, strategic planning. How do we want this site to be in 20 years from now? What do we want this site to become? Of course, whatever we do, whatever development we do in a site, we must also always make sure that this site is preserved forever. And in order to do this, we must do a proper risk assessment of each site. We must make sure that all the risks are managed properly, all the important risks are managed properly and in the right uh, context. And at the same time, we must make sure that the, uh, we have a proper uh, conservation mapping of every archaeological site so that we can start with the continuous conservation of every site. But then human resources must be trained and this have to do with everyone. You have visited sites in Greece, you know that, but you've visited sites all over the world and you know that. We need to train the guards, we need to train and have and use volunteers uh, and we have to make sure that even the heritage managers that are responsible always have access to the information that they need for the tasks, the new tasks that they may get. And so uh, we are going to uh, make sure that we digitize the sites properly, create a, an indelible record of how the project was before we start and uh, before we hand it over. Uh, and we want to make sure that there are education programs and when we're talking about education programs we're not talking about only kids we're talking about education programs for different ages for different segments of the visitor, visitors public and all that we must make sure that we do uh, first having attracted the local communities first making sure and there are quite a lot of you here that know very well what I'm talking about uh, first making sure that the locals are there first that the locals understand what their site is about and that they are there first to protect it they are there first to make sure that nobody digs illegally in there and they are there first to make sure that nobody paints with graffiti outside the walls 
And of course, after we uh, do all this, then we're able to promote the site. We're able to actually make the site accessible with specific products, be they educational or commercial, uh, give them over to the different segments of the international public. I had one more slide about the aims of the project, uh, but uh, I'm not going to be talking about the aims of the project because we have already spoken about them. The main theme is recharging the youth. The main theme is providing directly or indirectly jobs to the state and the private sector to develop around heritage, around perhaps tourism, so indirectly, um, but also to identify good practices, how they are adapted in the Greek local setting, and how can we propose for the future that the state works with individuals, with organizations for profit or non-for-profit. And so we might propose for the future how the state could perhaps consider managing the sites that they manage already in new ways. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kyriakidi. Um, I would like now to invite uh, the rest of our team, our distinguished guests, to comment on what we've heard on this proposal based on your experience and your knowledge in your uh, uh, specialized field. Um, I noted some questions like, um, was thinking how can we, the, the management of cultural heritage, how can it be a source of development in economic and, uh, economic and social in, in more detail or, or what do we need to do to make it work? or uh, if you have any good examples to share. So the floor is yours, I guess. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Fish, would you like to, to go first? Yes, but I think maybe I should, um, I'm gonna speak about Sorry. Um, Israel does a lot in, the, uh, uh, in this particular field, and I was going to focus during the presentation on three um, uh, current projects that are taking place by the Israel Antiquities Authority and uh, uh, public-private funding for developing uh, archaeological sites as archaeological heritage that relate specifically to this. So we have a lot of experience in this. The idea of how to do it correctly, the idea of how to bring private funding to this, management is crucial, innovation is crucial. You know, we developed a site right that I will speak about right outside the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, a huge undertaken that opened in 2001 and we keep on adding to it. We just recently added the first temple period. We keep on adding virtual reality mo um, um, models, um, different periods, different uh, education uh, ideas. So, so, so I will touch a little bit upon it, but this is really relating to what Nicoletta and um, uh, Evangelos um, uh, mentioned earlier. You know. So would you like to... So, yeah. so, um, I think what, what I'd like to share very briefly um, is what Israel does. Uh, the Israel Antiquities Authority, which is the uh, organization responsible for all matters of archaeology in Israel, a custodian of roughly 2 million objects, 32,000 declared archaeological sites. And our recent model uh, was this issue of um, a public-private uh, 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 undertaking and um, mainly private financing of major archaeological sites um, uh, uh, in Israel. And I was going to focus on three, one that was completed recently, as I said, the uh, Jerusalem Archaeological Park, the Davidson Center that opened in 2001, but is ongoing. Uh, the second one being the Shelby White and Leon Levy Lod Mosaic uh, Museum that is currently being built. Some of you may have seen the Lod Mosaic traveling around the world. Uh, it is now in England. And the last being the Schottenstein National Center for the Archaeology of Israel, which is a huge three, well, not as huge as what we saw last night, but 350,000 square foot uh, complex that will illuminate the entire archaeological experience that Israel has to propose under one roof designed by Moshe Safdi, and again, this is going on. So I was going to just comment about uh, uh, some of them. Uh, you know sites that were there from the beginning uh, of the country, you know, in, in the 50s and, and later in the 60s, Masada, uh, Caesarea, the beautiful site of Caesarea, but I will speak about the recent ones because these are the ones where the Israel Antiquities Authority put together this partnership between private funding, big private funding, 
and public uh, funds and public management, such as the Jerusalem Archaeological Park outside the Temple Mount enclosure near the southern wall of the Temple Mount, the southern part of the western wall, with a lot of private funding that helped us develop an area that was completely neglected until 2001 and now brings roughly 350,000 visitors a year to see the different archaeological periods in Jerusalem. The Davidson Center, a highlight of the park, located in situ inside the park, showcasing through educational projects, uh, multimedia, uh, virtual reality model in a brand new building. I'm just showing some examples. Um, uh, um, what, what Jerusalem has to offer inside the storage rooms of the Umayyad palaces. And this is really the way, this is the picture of the virtual reality model. Um, so we have your partnership with leading organizations such as UCLA that developed this real-time virtual simulation, which will apply anywhere, here in Greece, in Italy, in Turkey, in Israel, and, and, and keeps on bringing people. The recent development just last year of the first temple period, so you have to keep on innovating and expanding. The Shelby White and Leon Levy Museum is perfect example of what happens when you discover in a, in a very uh, socioeconomic um, uh, depressed area in a perfect location not far from the airport, right off the Tel Aviv Jerusalem Highway, for those of you that know, the most brilliant example of an 1800 square foot perfect condition mosaic floor dating to 300, 310, surrounded by a complex like this of housing projects, very depleted, very terrible. What do you do with this? You know, and we decided we will um, uh, uh, construct a museum around this 2,000 square foot roughly mosaic um, uh, to help in the socioeconomic look at the stunning mosaic floor that's right there, 80 centimeters below ground level. We're building a m museum for it. It's traveling now around the world. It was in the Louvre, it was at the Metropolitan Museum. Here is the mosaic in the Louvre in Berlin. While we're promoting it around the world, getting more funding for it, we are building the museum for the city of Lod that will focus only on one mosaic. We'll bring 200, 250,000, 300,000 people to a place that didn't see one person before. They'll spend $10, they'll spend 12, however much they'll spend, and it'll help the city. And the last being the J. N. G. Schottenstein National Campus for the Archaeology of Israel, currently being built, 350,000 square foot that will have under one roof roughly two million objects. It'll be a center for all the archaeological heritage of the country, open conservation laboratories. The idea is to promote archaeology and explain what archaeology is about, how to manage it, how to take care of it, in the heart of Jerusalem, in a beautiful building, make archaeology available, accessible. Even the building resembles an archaeological excavation. You go down into the building, it'll open. This is the construction. Two million objects viewable to the public. People will be able to go through the housing center, touch the coins, touch the ancient glass, see the work done in the laboratories, get people excited about it. How do you conserve the Dead Sea Scrolls? How do you make them available to the public? How do you conserve glass? Teach children, teach visitors, so they will know what is there at the end of the day and how important it is. We can talk about it more because I really wanted to keep it brief, but this is what is being done in Israel as we speak. We're doing big projects with private funding, public management, public funding to make it all accessible and available to the public. So I hope, I hope. thank you. Thank you. Um, now I would like to invite Mr. Wright for his part. Thank you, uh, thank you for inviting me. I was at the conference in April and I've been studying the notes from that conference since then. Um, I will cut right to the point since we um, have uh, somewhat less lim limited time in comparison to what we had expected. Um, there were a number of things spoken about uh, today in the plenary session, and I want to focus first on the subject, recharging the youth. What is the relationship between youth unemployment and cultural tourism? This is a fundamental question. Uh, to me, this also uh, gets to another question that was raised this morning, issues of scale. When you're in a crisis, you need to think about issues of scale, and you can't accomplish everything that you want to do at once. You need to do two things. 
you need to react with strong medicine that deals with the problem at hand, and it has to be tailored just for that. So you have to examine it and figure out what the problem is and marshal the resources to manage that particular problem. But when you're in a parachmi, as we say in Greece, when you're in the trough, when you're at the bottom of things, that's the best time to sit back and say, let's also plan for the future. What kind of long-term strategies do we need to develop and what would be the policies around them? The American School of Classical Studies at Athens has been here in Greece since 1881. We have rich experience and we also have rich resources. The director of the Gennadius Library, Maria Yorgopoulou, is here today and she's one example of an institution that has been contributing to the cultural advancement of Greece for a very long time. But at the same time, we have been carrying out excavations throughout Greece, through our affiliated institutions, from Thrace all the way to Crete and across the islands. But we do have two premier excavations, the excavations of the Athenian Agora, which began in 1931 and continue today, and the excavations at, eight, at ancient Corinth, which began in 1896. And we have in the audience today uh, Mr. Ken Lusbader, who is the senior program officer of the uh, J.M. Kaplan Fund. And the Kaplan Fund provided us with funding to organize a three-day workshop last weekend at ancient Corinth with representatives of the Ministry of Culture and the Byzantine and post-Byzantine ephoria, as well as the prehistoric and classical ephoria for the purpose of trying to figure out how we can coordinate and cooperate to get together to develop a master plan for cultural tourism at ancient Corinth. What does this have to do with youth unemployment? It has to do with both unemployment and underemployment. And one of the themes that was enunciated this morning was the need to provide meaningful internships on the one hand, and also to provide professional advancement positions of significant value. This is more in the area of thinking about building and enhancing an infrastructure that will produce long-term results. If we have massive unemployment, we need to figure out exactly who's unemployed and how we can get them off the unemployment rolls and what kind of meaningful employment and careers we can provide for them. And one of the things that's very apparent from my own experience working with colleagues in the various ephorias in Greece is that they are tasked with two responsibilities, one of which is to manage the archaeological resources of the region that is under their responsibility, and that includes an enormous amount of salvage work. In the area of ancient Corinth, the Corinth de Patras road construction has uncovered an area over 500 meters long, about 30 to 50 meters wide, with hundreds of tombs from the Middle Bronze Age through the Roman period, with walls, with a significant, in fact, the largest Mycenaean settlement ever discovered. Who, for those of us in the field, we would have said, who would ever have thought that we would have a large Mycenaean settlement in Corinth? Managing that kind of salvage work is a huge undertaking. Another example of such salvage work is the construction of the National Opera House and Library, where the Ephoria in Piraeus has been excavating a cemetery that has produced 1,069 skeletons. When the Ephorias are charged to carry out this work, their resources are severely tasked. What would be a solution to handling not only that kind of work, which in every instance is funded through private activities, whether it's the road building contractors or the Nearchos Foundation, but there is a follow through that will continue for about 10 years of study, conservation, assessment of this material, determination about how it best be used. And here there is an opportunity to seek funding to provide for internships and for reasonable one, two, three year, even four, five year employment for professionals of different kinds that can speak both to the needs of protecting and advancing the cultural resources that we find, but also to provide people with meaningful training that will bridge the period of an economic crisis. But the larger question that has to do with the long-term issues 
are those that, in particular, Nicoletta Velacu just spoke to, and that is planning for cultural tourism, the subject of this session. And the workshop that we conducted in Corinth was oriented towards beginning a conversation with the aid of professional consultants to figure out how the American school as a private entity could work in partnership with government employees and institutions who have the authoritative responsibilities to develop a plan that would advance not only the preservation of monuments, but their presentation within a larger touristic whole. This is a major and complicated issue, and the school can bring technical support as well as leverage funding for such kinds of activities. And in order to advance that, we brought a consultant from the Getty Conservation Institute, the former president of English Heritage, uh, a well-known uh, architectural conservation historian, and a number of people to talk about case studies that were similar to Corinth as an instance uh, for uh, a comparison. So the American school as an institution that's well established in Greece itself has considerable expertise to bring to the table. And uh, we have just gotten a small grant to uh, provide for a three-year internship in support of educational programming at Corinth and in the Corinth Museum. We would like to offer meaningful internships from six months to a year for students who are developing or interested in becoming professionals in different areas and we can place them in our excavations, we can place them in our storerooms, we can place them in our archaeological science lab laboratory, we can place them in the Gennadius Library where we have professional librarians who are wrestling with the problems of managing manuscript, rare libraries, special collections in a world of increasing digitization of resources. And we think that at the same time we could undertake to have professionals come in and work with us for one to two to three years in meaningful employment that would enhance their skills and provide them with the ability to find permanent employment in the public or the private sector in the future. So I just give this as an example because it is something that um, I feel it needs to be discussed in very practical ways to come up with solutions that can, as I said, meet immediate needs on the one hand, but actually help build and partnership with responsible institutions for long-term solutions that will speak directly to the economic needs of cultural tourism. One of the things that those of us who are trained as academics and receive academic PhDs need to understand as a part of our ethical responsibilities to the field is that it is not merely sufficient for us to exercise our academic interests by carrying out research without understanding that most of what we do is supported by tax dollars that people pay into the tax coffers. That means that we're accountable for and we're responsible to the public. And as people who study on unearth, discover the past, and we have an equal responsibility to bring that past into meaningful contact with the public. Cultural tourism is an economic activity that's vital for the future of Greece. It's vital for the current economy. We have a responsibility to participate in the development of meaningful cultural tourism in the country. And that does not mean that we simply sit and do our research. It doesn't mean that we simply publish results of our research. It means that we also participate in the economic development of infrastructure that provides meaningful experiences for people, uh, such as the different archaeological parks that have been illustrated in the examples by the preceding speakers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And for the end, Ms. Mikhailovich, it's your turn. Thank you. Um, first of all, I really feel privileged to be um, um, attending this conference and uh, to be part of this distinguished panel. I'm surrounded by distinguished uh, scholars, uh, archaeologists. I feel humble because I feel that I am uh, an activist 
for cultural heritage in Europe, and I will speak as an activist. I, I just uh, I want to warn you uh, in advance. Uh, and, um, and also, I feel very privileged, uh, uh, in fact, to be here, the voice of entire Europe. Between, that's the place between the United States and Israel a little bit, this vast area, uh, Europa Nostra, uh, and with all cultural heritage, it seeks to be the voice of cultural heritage in Europe. And believe me, there are uh, quite some heritage sites that we need all together. We have a responsibility to preserve, and we had the responsibility to share it with a, a largest possible audience, but at the same time to preserve it also for, for the posterity and the future generations. Um, so, uh, and I also want to thank, of course, very much um, uh, the hosts of this conference, the organizers of the conference, uh, Stavros Tiago Foundation. Um, one year ago, in fact, Europa Nostra organized the sort of Golden Jubilee Congress uh, here in Athens, um, and uh, uh, both the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Stavros Niarchos Foundation were our main partners for the conference, and I just want to thank you for that support. Uh, we have produced, with your support, a Greek special of our magazine, Heritage in Motion. Uh, I have here copies for all the panelists, and whoever in the audience would like, perhaps, to take a copy of it. It was, in fact, Europa Nostra's tribute uh, uh, to to Greece as a sort of cornerstone of Europe of culture, of Europe of heritage. And many people asking themselves, uh, is her Greece still having a place in Europe? And that was our response, indeed, how could we imagine Europe without Greece and without what the, uh, the heritage uh, that in this country means for all of us uh, Europeans. And, and so Europa Nostra, uh, just very briefly for all, the, all of you who do not know, we are in fact an advocacy organization, an umbrella organization of heritage, NGOs, civil society organizations, associations and foundations, big and very small, we are fighting uh, involving civil society involving young people very much, very often as volunteers, but also as, as staff. Uh, um, and, and this is a large, I can tell you, a large force, a large movement that we have in Europe. And we, it is our task to be the voice of that movement, to be the, uh, the, the spokesperson uh, and animator of that movement. And when I say Europe, I don't think only the Europe of the European Union. I myself come from Belgrade. Serbia, not yet a member of the European Union, I hope one day it will become, but in fact for us Europe is from Portugal to Russia, from Norway to, um, to Turkey, and, and, and in all that we, we have some shared responsibilities, shared concerns uh, and shared opportunities. Um, this session is about um, cult promoting cultural tourism. Obviously cultural heritage is the strategic resource. Uh, for promoting cultural tourism. And uh, I want to share with you, because I, I would like to just put this, uh, this discussion also in the wider perspective, what's going on in Europe, in fact. And what's going on in Europe, also not only at the level of civil society, but on the level of the uh, institutions, big institutions. And I want to share you with good news, because very often you hear bad news from Europe, but there is some good news. And it is very much thanks to the Hellenic Ministry for Culture. As you know, Greece is chairing the European Union in three more days. Uh, and, and, and has done a fantastic job. Uh, the Council of Ministers in charge of culture on the 21st of May in Brussels adopted what we believe are the historic conclusions. The conclusion saying, believe it or not, that cultural heritage is strategic resource for a sustainable Europe. And this word, sustainable, extremely important word in these conclusions. And congratulations to our friends. We have also been working very closely with you that you have got all the 28 member states uh, uh, unanimously to make that important political statement and to encourage all the new parliament, the new European Commission to work in indeed uh, uh, developing what they say an integrated approach to cultural heritage. Because we cannot on one side uh, support cultural heritage and develop such interesting projects, partnership like we have just heard, uh, that the Ministry of Culture uh, can um, do things to promote cultural heritage, to safeguard, to promote education, training. But it is on, uh, on the other side, 
ministries for economy, ministries of energy, ministries of, of development, who are taking um, um, decisions that are fundamentally against the interest of the long-term protection of cultural heritage. So that idea that European Union is promoting, and it has to be promoted at all level of governments, from the European to the local, uh, that we have to have an integrated approach to cultural heritage through all the various policies which have a direct and indirect uh, impact on, on cultural heritage. And um, uh, European Union also, a few years ago, adopted uh, a communication on Europe, um, tourist destination number one in the world. It is today your tourist destination number one. Uh, is it going to remain? It is to be seen, but that is what Europe wants to uh, invest in. And of course, a very large segment of that uh, tourism is a cultural, uh, cultural tourism. But then we have a problem. So. We should not hear talking only about uh, um, wonderful thing we can do uh, by, by, by preserving I mean, uh, this type of uh, initiatives. All the initiatives that we have heard are very, very important. And we need to do more to exchange these best practices. And that is what your project is about, not only within one country, but across borders. We are certainly promoting this exchange of best practices um, at European level, because we happen to be the organizer of the European Union Prize for Cultural Heritage, Europa Nostra Awards. And, and in fact, uh, through giving these awards, we are promoting best practices. And we very much look forward to working with you because I think that is so important that we learn from each other from these best practices and from these success stories. Uh, but at the same time, our task is to uh, uh, also come together when heritage is in danger. And indeed, the cultural her tourism promotion is also, some, there is very often also a very short-term uh, objective to have next year how many million more visitors we want to have. So how we are going to cope with all those visitors, how we are going to um, welcome them, how, what is the impact of all this increase of tourists going to have on the cultural heritage, which is in fact the main resource that we have for the promotion of cultural tourism. That's why we have been, we have been organizing also conferences and, and and developing a declaration that saying that we have to strike the right balance between uh, promoting cultural tourism and preserving our cultural heritage. So that we have to promote, in fact, not any cultural tourism, but we have to promote a responsible, a sustainable, a high quality uh, uh, tourism. And I think this is very much the task of all of us who are in, engaged in various ways, as scholars, as activists, as, as, as uh, administrator, governments, we have to work on that because we have big danger. And since we are in Greece, and I said I am an activist, so we are in Greece, some very, very boring things are happening in this country. And I think we have to speak about that. Because of course Greece has to, has to uh, create jobs, has to uh, uh, sort of invest in, in development. But precisely because of that, we are informed about uh, developments um, that uh, the ministry, uh, that, that, uh, that the government is contemplating, uh, relaxing the land use um, planning and, and land uh, use planning uh, rules uh, to allow a large scale developments, constructions, also uh, tourism, uh, uh, tourism, uh, so to tourist homes on on areas also in very much in coastal areas because that's what your gold is. You, it's your gold mine, your coastline, uh, your not only archaeological sites but also your cultural landscape and your natural beauties. And that, um, that as we are speaking, the parliament is discussing some very worrying um, law proposals. And we believe that also the, the foundations like the Niarchos Foundations and uh, others together with the organization like Europa Nostra, we have to speak up. Because again, this is, uh, uh, we understand that we need to uh, invest in, in cultural tourism and the short term is very important. But we cannot at the same time destroy what is the basis of that cultural tourism. And there are many examples of those stress. I mean, apart from construction, uh, along the coastline, see what Spain has done. Don't do here in Greece the same, uh, the, the same mistakes that, that Spain has done. Uh, 
cruisers, cruisers, see what, I mean, the cruise, the, the, the images of cruise ships, uh, they can't be bigger, every day bigger, bigger in, in Venice or in Dubrovnik, very close places here. Another issue that one of our members uh, told me, what about the waste management? I mean, we are going, how much we can, we can absorb of all that? And just, I know I have so much to tell you, but I want to finish with one, one because I was so inspired last night with the event that you have organized. I want to thank you all for that la last night event. And the words of Renzo Piano uh, saying, it is also about beauty. And, and, and in fact, this, this dance of the cranes, what an imaginative idea that you have had. Well, I think it deserves the applause, but I thought how poetic, how excited we were, but because the project was so wonderful. It was a, a project of a beauty, of a sustainability, an example of constructions we want to promote. I don't think we would have enjoyed all dances of cranes around Europe because there are construction sites that they are destroying very much the character, the historic character of our places. But what we saw last night, I think that was something that is so symbolic as something which we would like to have like a motto for the future and to finish. I saw in this wonderful publication that you have produced, Renzo Piano paraphrased um, something that it seems that the pledge of the Athenian hoplites. And he said, I want to give back a city more beautiful than the one I initially encountered. And I thought for Europa Nostra, we will paraphrase Renzo Piano and say that the motto for the new narrative for Europe should be, let us give back a Europe more beautiful than the one we initially encountered. So this is my message for you. Thank you for your very lively presentation. <laughs> um, before I give the floor to the public, I would just like another question for, for the panelists. If you can just reply in one phrase, not a word, but a phrase. If you would definitely include something in an effort to upgrade, promote a, an archaeological site, what would it be? In a phrase, if you had to definitely include something, an element, uh, in, an, in a project to upgrade, to... Uh, I have an answer. Ah. The, the most important thing is to engage the community in what you're doing. As an archaeologist, I would install walkways and signage that explained what the archaeologists are doing so that when the archaeologists come into the site, they don't look at some static, fixed thing, but they see an active process of discovery and they can participate in it, and it opens up a venue for them to think about the past as ever-changing and ever reinterpreted by the process of engagement with it, not just the excavation, not just the presentation of it, but the actual engagement of the public with it. So as local communities have been taken care of, um, I would say that um, a visit to an archaeological site should be a life-changing experience. And to be able to do this, we have to have the narrative that is actually relevant to the people that are visiting, so that actually it is a transformative experience whenever we actually visit a heritage site uh, and we come out of that site as better people. If I may, from the uh, Israeli experience, and, and you know, I only showed three such sites, but we have we have ongoing, uh, probably 50, 60 at the same time. Um, I think education and innovation. How do you bring people back to the site? As far as we are concerned, is very important because once you have, you know, a visitor going to the Jerusalem Archaeological Park, you want to bring him back. It's not enough to just bring him there once, him or her once. And the question is, how do you attract people to come again and again and learn more? So the innovation in education, using uh, issues similar to social media, to, you know, we're building an app for children now, for, you know, seven-year-olds to be able to play on their smartphones with the Dead Sea Scrolls or with the Lord Mosaic doing puzzles bringing it all the way to really the little kids, the young kids. And, you know, I concur with the uh, previous 
uh, uh, suggestions that you have to have the community participate from the beginning. We have, we employ in our excavation sites, we employ, there was a very important project called Project 500 where we employed uh, with uh, financing from the Ministry of Labor, unemployed uh, people in Israel of all different levels, uh, 750 at a time, and the project closed maybe five years ago, and we now have 35 um, uh, regular full-time employees of the Israel Antiquities Authority that specialize in conservation uh, who are you know, members of this uh, uh, 500 project uh, that we had before, so really getting the community involved from the beginning of the excavation all the way to the end. Uh, in uh, one phrase only, to bring together local communities with uh, the archaeological sites, their cultural heritage at, in every area of, uh, of, the, of, of, the, of the country. And from then, I think uh, uh, everything will be after that be better. This is to be together with the local communities. So we try on that. And uh, I agree with all the proposals of my friends here. Okay. Um, Evangelos said it should be a life-changing experience. I think it should also be an emotional experience. Yes, educational, but also emotional. Um, the sense of enchantment, the sense of wonder, and perhaps also the sense of pride. We heard that the, the fantastic photographer who spoke about that, that in order to also boost the morale, we also need to boost the sense of pride and the sense of belonging. And in fact, to come back to the main focus of this session, uh, the whole morning recharging the youth, um, cultural heritage and recharging the youth, it's not only about creating a job opportunities, Heritage can bring to youth knowledge in that, that sense of belonging, that sense of pride, and also uh, an area where they can also volunteer because we won't solve the problem of job uh, uh, unemployment tomorrow. So in the meantime, they can volunteer, and many of them are doing that. And so all that, I think we should have a holistic, more holistic approach to what are the benefits that cultural heritage can also bring to youth and as such to the future of our society. If I, if I may, ju just one more, more comment relating to this, again, from, from, from experience. The problem here is now, and this is really coming from the Israel Antiquities Authority, where you have, you know, I don't know, 50 excavations a year. The question is, all right, so you discover, you know, a wall of an ancient synagogue or an ancient church, you know, in, in the current season of excavation. What do you do with it? Do you develop it? I mean, do we look at every site as a cultural heritage site? We have to really know what we choose and how much funds to invest in such places. And we have to know that they'll be attractive. I have, I don't know, probably 50 sites with mosaics that were discovered in the past you know, 10 years of great mosaics. I mean, Aluma a few months ago in the Negev, mosaics up in the north. Do you keep them all? Absolutely not. Who will maintain it? I mean, who will take care of it? How do you do it? And this is a tricky thing. Because you know you don't always find a Lord mosaic that shall be white, and you know others you know will be willing to pour I don't know millions of dollars to 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 keep. You have to, and this is really where your conservators you have to work together with your conservators, your excavators, your educators. We have a whole group in our 500-person organization that sits together to decide which site you focus on, you develop, and really. Make it because it's not enough to say, you know, we get excited, it has to be enchanting by looking at one stone. I mean, this is not what we mean, but we have a lot of stones in this archaeology. So you have to, you have to go. It, it, it sounds obvious, but it's not so when you have so many projects going on and you have so many finds. And this is really what it is, I think. Well, now the floor to the public. Yes, please. Yes, I'd like My name is Costa Karras, and I'm Vice President of Europa Nostra, and I'm also the founder of Eliniki Eteria Perivandus Kepolitismo in Greece. I wanted to make a comment taking, um, taking further from what Jacob Fish said, um, and this uh, refers to the involvement of private funds in uh, public activities as a way uh, also of creating employment and creating growth in particular regions. 
In fact, um, there are at least two such propositions uh, available to the Greek government today, and one of them comes directly from Europa Nostra, because Europa Nostra has funded in the last six months a study on the Tatoi estate, which is an important historical estate, uh, respecting entirely the national ownership, the state ownership, but also proposing to bring in both local supporters, friends of Tatoi, uh, also donors from abroad, foundations, uh, also international organizations like the European Heritage Houses Association and Europa Nostra itself. Now here is exactly the sort of proposal which Jacob Fish has talked about and which has been so successful in Israel uh, as a proposition for Greece. And we, of course, will be seeking the support both of the uh, Neakos Foundation and of many others and above all of the Greek government in order for that to go ahead. That's case number one. Case number two, at an earlier stage, the same sort of thing that could be done for modern Greek history in relation to Tatoi can be done for ancient Greek history in the case of Marathon. Both cases close to Athens, both cases where which could become destinations of their own right and where while promoting scholarship one will also give a great uh, impetus to local employment and growth. Thank you. Just a comment by Mr. Wright before we go on to the next question. Um, at, the, at the risk of um, raising a, 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 a delicate issue, um, it, it seems to me that the question of public-private partnerships and also of private intervention is one that's worth considering. And I'm only speaking about this because of rich experience uh, in my own household. Uh, with cultural, of private cultural resource management firms. When we talk about providing jobs in the United States and also throughout the United Kingdom, there are cultural resource management firms. They are private entities, they are for profit entities, in fact. They compete for contracts from government agencies to conduct environmental and cultural impact statements and studies of things that are uh, going to be affected. So if a telephone company is putting telephone lines through or a gas company is putting a natural gas line through a region, the private firms bid for those, get contracts from public agencies or from the private groups that are paying for those and it becomes a portion of their budget. And there are very large firms that provide meaningful long-term professional career employment um, that in, in no way affect the responsibilities of public agencies for managing them. And given the enormous amount of excavation and salvage excavation that goes on in Greece, uh, in the process by which it's conducted by the archaeological ephorias, I have often wondered if the ephorias would be, would work hand in hand with private entities like that if a space was opened up for them to exist, because the existing staff in ephorias have enormous amount of work and responsibilities in being the managers of the heritage resources that they have including handling their storerooms, the museums, the sites, visitors who come to the sites, and so forth. They set policy, they have ultimate responsibility. Uh, but at the same time, they're called out constantly to do the salvage work. And I only thought about this because if we're talking about providing jobs for people, in the U.S., this became a real growth industry, and we saw thousands and thousands of jobs from people digging in trenches to people at executive levels. Uh, and this process, this, this, these firms came into existence in the 1970s in a big way, um, but have since blossomed into rather. Uh, um, I'm afraid I must interrupt you. Uh, yeah, I'll just and I just say, you know, me, uh, there are large-scale firms that also meet the highest professional standards uh, of the discipline. Thank you. Well, yeah, we have five minutes, so any question can take now. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, Diana Walters from Her Cultural Heritage Without Borders, a uh, recent recipient of the Europa Nostra Best Practice Award. Thank you very much um, for recognizing our work. A lot of our work with cultural heritage focused on the former Yugoslavia um, is around the question of cultural heritage and cultural tourism as resources for peace building. And I'd like to introduce uh, a plural into this discussion, which is talking about communities and narratives. Um, and it is, I think, the area of where we have contested narratives, uh, which frankly is everywhere. Um, and it uh, doesn't matter where, whether, you know, which particular aspect of the heritage industry that you come from, not to recognize that I think is naive or potentially even foolish in the current political climate, considering with what we've just witnessed in Europe and the recent results of the European elections, um, which I, I fully accept is contentious and debatable, but there we are, that's my position. Um, so I suppose what I would like to, to ask the panel is, when we reflect on the fact that youth particularly, unemployed youth particularly, angry unemployed youth particularly, are the people who are most likely to be recruited to what we might consider to be extreme, aggressive nationalist movements, or even fascist movements, what is the role of cultural heritage and cultural tourism in actually um, promoting a peace building and a multiple narrative and, and contested history perspective? Thank you. We take another one, and then uh, we answer all together the questions. There is a question there. My name is Sinodinos. I'm from uh, the um, I'm from the Cyclades, Amargos, and I also work at the Archbishopric of Athens. I heard three of the speakers talking about engagement of local society in uh, archaeological excavations uh, and in how they can actively be involved in archaeological sites and so on and so forth. We know that Greece has financial problems right now. That is known to everyone. It's not possible for us to have a lot of guards for the archaeological sites. And uh, a lot of people are being fired. A lot of guards are being fired instead of taking on more guards and archaeological sites which we have promoted, and it's been a very hard job. And I'm saying this because uh, Mrs. Uh, Uh, the lady from Europa Nostra, Mrs. Mikhailovich, uh, Mr. Karas, uh, and actually they've done a lot about Amargos, and actually Mrs. Maragou uh, did something in Amargos, but this site remains closed, unfortunately. And this is very difficult because we have a lot of tourists coming to the islands, but we can promote cultural tourism. It's not just our sun and sea, it's not just our mountains, and it's not just the lovely animals or, or flora and fauna. So we also have cultural to promote. And I remember that in the past, and I'm referring to Mrs. Valaku, whom I've known for many years, please speed up, please speed up, please be brief. So in the past, we had a lot of curators who worked for free, curators of activities. These people were mainly uh, retired teachers, uh, retired archaeologists, people who loved archaeology and who loved their homeland. They kept these sites open and they supervised them. So why can't we do it again? Why can't we use this possibility? And as a church, we also have a museum, an ecclesiastical museum, a church museum on the island of Amargos. So we know that the church is paying the guard now so that it's always open and accessible to the public. So I think that it's good to have curators who work for free and who don't get paid. I think this is good for the summer season on the Greek islands. Thank you. Um, Victor Cohen from the School of Visual Arts and a history buff. I would like to uh, mention that since um, archaeological sites without contexts are just stones, and context only comes from education, and from, uh, from me being a product of the Greek 
educational system a um, hundred years ago, maybe, but I cannot imagine things have changed so drastically. I always had the lack and the disconnect between my history books in an earlier age and what that meant and how they connected with actual archaeology. When now, with a lot of study on my own, I get this thrill that you get in any stone that is older than two days old, but that's very hardly translatable to a child that is the basis to the society, not because the cliche of children being our future, but just because parents follow their children, parents are able to change norms and forms and take their parents by the hands and take them to places that mean things to them. So instead of children having dinosaur obsessions, they can have amazing archeological, archeologically connected obsessions to these magical places we have in Greece. And I just wonder if there is a movement afoot to change history books, to connect them with this live archeology span we have in Greece and bring them completely to life so the kids want to watch other things that Dora the Explorer and could be Andonis the Explorer that will bring them. Because uh, education, the combination of education and entertainment, actually it's edutainment, yes, um, would be the way to do it. And I, and I think that through programs you would find a lot of volunteers to really donate their time to develop the apps or whatever else we're going to come up with in 10 years to bring things to life and bring the people to the archaeology sites again and again. Because in order, I agree, to, to bring people and get them into the sites and the sites inside of them, they need to be re repeat visitors and have the things that will bring them. And, and I think education is the only way to do it as early as possible. Um, would you like to reply in any of the questions? can reply briefly to both. The political, again, from, it's only from experience, so it's easy to sit here because we have a lot of experience, but, you know, and I don't want to get into the politics of it, but the Antiquities Authority in Israel is responsible for archaeological sites that deal with every religion and every race. So we, we, we're excavating in the same Jerusalem archaeological park that I showed earlier. You have a second temple period, first temple period, an Umayyad, an early Muslim period, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So we excavate and we take care of archaeological sites belonging to the different uh, national groups, political groups, and uh, also we employ uh, a, a Palestinian um, a population in our excavation sites. They are part of this thing. We let them control it. We let them run some of the uh, uh, areas that are discovered within their uh, communities. So the answer is yes, I think it's a very good idea and you really have to work you know, with all these groups together. In education, we start already in seventh grade in Israel, you have, you know, towards matriculation, you already have, there's a whole subject called archaeology in the school system that, you know, where archaeology is taught, you can take it as a subject, you can matriculate in it, and then you can continue and, 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 and go forward. And as I said before, the app that we're developing now is for seven-year-olds. So, you know, you can get younger than seven, Um, being myself from the Balkans, I can't help uh, uh, making um, uh, um, uh, some reaction to what you said. Uh, once again, congratulations for what Cultural Heritage Without Borders is doing. And I think you are also very successful in involving young people, because if I'm not mistaken, most of the people involved in the projects done by organization in the Balkans and Southeast Europe are very much the young people. It shows uh, what I want to say that uh, uh, I wouldn't say that the young people are necessarily the one who are the most uh, inclined to be um, um, extremist and radicals, and uh, I think that uh, in, in, in the Balkans, like in many other places, there is also the older generation who is much more inclined to manipulate all the others and uh, sort of in, involve them in a sort of uh, in, in a narrative which is a narrative of conflict and, conf and of exclusion. So you are right, of course, in such uh, cases, but it's not only the Balkans, 
everywhere in Europe and elsewhere in the world. You have many communities connecting. It's rarely only one community connected with some heritage site. And there are so multiple layers uh, of, of identity of a site. And indeed, it is that story, that story of the multiple identity and the multiple layers we need to be taught. So we come then to the, the question of education. And I know that since our Vice President Costa Caras is here, they have, um, that this wonderful uh, project of a joint uh, uh, history books project in, uh, for the Center of Reconciliation um, and Democracy in Southeast Europe. Precisely, in fact, it is extremely important to combine uh, sort of experience, heritage experience, with history education. And history, when they say history education, you are absolutely right. It has to be much more connected with heritage education because heritage is a sort of living history that so you can touch it, you can feel it, and then you can understand or also history and all that multiple layers better. And hopefully then, if you are uh, um, uh, experiencing uh, history and uh, learning history in this way, hopefully then young or old are, being, are going to be less um, prone to all sorts of extremist political uh, developments that we are now, now having. So it is uh, indeed also an investment, not only in economy, it is investing on the preserving uh, the democracy in our societies. We have to close, so two words and... I just want to say a couple of things about uh, training, about schools and history books, and it's linked to archaeology. Let me tell you that we have a program, Melina. This was a program that was done between the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Culture. A lot of great things were done. We have wonderful lessons on this particular issue. I know that the Ministry of Education just put it on the back burner. I think we need to bring it to the fore again because it's a very interesting subject now unpaid curators I think what we're trying to do through the new programs now is to organize through local communities volunteerism. So we want to have banks of volunteers, but the right volunteers, the ones that can really offer. Now, you remember that these unpaid curators of the period before the war, that's a little bit difficult to have again. But let me talk about uh, these excavations, salvage excavations. There's a lot of them going on, but we've been able to include all this uh, salvage research, which is carrying out uh, when we have large-scale projects, construction work, all this uh, money, I'm talking about uh, recruitment of new staff, this is done through the project and this is provided for in the legislation. So very safely we collect all the information and all the artifacts that we need to assess and so on and so forth. And one last thing, despite all this, it's a difficult period we're going through. We're going through a very difficult crisis. We are helping as much as we can when it comes to youth unemployment. We have a lot of seasonal staff, a lot of young people we have had. Now, we've got 33 sites, which as of the 1st of April have taken on some people. They're open from 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock in the evening, all museums, all important archaeological sites. And this shows how hard we're trying to have more people working for us. That's all I had to say. Thank you very much. So, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Thank you all, panelists and audience, for your questions. I know there are still more, but you can continue discussing during lunch. There is a nice buffet upstairs. And see you at 2.30 in the main hall. Bon appétit.